Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. Europe, 476 AD. After centuries of decline, the barbarian warlord Odoacer has removed Western Rome's final clear emperor, Romulus Augustulus, from power. Though the empire would continue in the east for another thousand years, in what historians sometimes call the Byzantine Empire, this moment marks the end of the western half of the empire and the end of an era. Following the collapse, Europe is finally plunged into a dark age, which would last until the 11th century, though some things would take even longer to come back. There was a notable and often measurable decline in population, literacy, rate of innovation, rate of advancement in areas like science and philosophy, a decline in trade and economic stability, political stability, sanitary conditions, social organization, rise in warfare, rise in corruption, rise in isolation, etc., each coming together to signal the beginning of worse times. Though some scholars dislike the term Dark Age, there is a strong argument that can be made that life in 500 AD was worse than 1 AD for your average Roman, and it would be some time before Europe got back on its feet. Fast forward 1,544 years to the year 2020. The average person in the developed world lives a far better life than even the most well-off Romans at the Empire's height. We have gone much, much further than the Romans or any other people in the history of the world. And in fact, despite some dark moments, the past two centuries or so have been the most prosperous in human history across the globe. Not even the greatest of past empires could dream of what we have today. The question of today's video, however, is what if we faced a situation of decline similar to that of Rome or another major civilization, as we must keep in mind that Rome was not the only civilization to rise and fall. Egypt, the ancient Greeks, the Islamic world, China, Southeast Asia, the pre-Columbian American civilizations, India, they have each gone through periods of highs and lows, which we would call collapses as well. It has happened numerous times across the planet. Some civilizations rebound, others disappear from the earth entirely. What if it happened to us? What if things got worse? What if our society collapsed? This is not the question of what could cause our civilization to collapse, nor whether or not it might actually do so. Today, we are simply asking what would happen if it did? If we lost the power to hold up the advances made in the past 200 or even more years? This video will be divided into two segments. Firstly, we will be looking at the short and midterm consequences. What would happen in the first hundred or so years following such a collapse? What would life be like for those of us alive today? Next, we will look at the long term, the next several centuries. Would new countries arise or would new ones take over? How would languages change? How would war, transportation, and industry change? What would life be like for our descendants, or at least the descendants of those of us who survive? Some argue that collapse is an inevitable point reached by all civilizations. Others are more optimistic. Regardless, it is my sincere hope that we overcome whatever challenges with which we are faced in the future as much as possible and that this video remains just an educational and hopefully entertaining thought experiment. But if things ever do go seriously wrong in our lifetimes, then I hope that this video will be useful. Who knows, maybe one of you out there will remember it and use the information to save your life one day. Anyway, let's get to it. Before we begin, I would like to thank Jacob Sewers, Eileen Babbitt, Frogman Savage, and Roger Smith for being our most recent supporters on Patreon. They join these supporters who make these videos possible. Also, let's address the elephant in the room here before we get going. I'm not basing this video off current events. I am not here to spread fear, and I think that while current events are concerning, brighter days will at some point be coming. Now then, though our question is not how civilization could collapse, be it war, nuclear winter, disease, economic collapse, an asteroid strike, or a combination of those things, or whatever the case may be, but rather what would happen if it did, we still have to define what we mean by collapse. Broadly, we're talking about a situation where the technology, political structure, social structure, economic conditions, standard of living, social organization, etc., which have developed in recent centuries, at least since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, break down and can no longer be supported for one reason or another across the entire planet. 
We can and will draw on history to answer these questions, but keep in mind that if it were to happen, we are also very different from the people of the past, and so we would probably follow a different route, one which in many ways would be unpredictable. 2040 AD. The Great Calamity, a combination of several factors, has hit. From Alaska to New Zealand, the world feels its effects. Order breaks down. Governments cannot control the situation. The Great Calamity having disabled the arms of the world's governments. Communities across the planet, now containing 10 billion people, are largely left on their own. They cannot depend on much help getting out of the struggles to come. What are some of the first things which would break down in the event of such a collapse? Well, a lot of the tragedies would probably take place within the first few decades. As order breaks down, people become reclusive. Governments are ineffective and in some areas cease to exist. Conflict, even wars, break out as people struggle for resources and take advantage of the situation to assume power. It becomes harder to manage the things which we today take for granted. Our modern lifestyles depend on a whole list of very complex systems functioning like they're supposed to. When the Great Calamity hits, those systems will stop functioning like they're supposed to. Like a house of cards, the bigger and more complex it is, the greater the mess it creates when it falls apart. We've climbed much higher than Rome and so we have further to fall. The first few decades will consist of trying to get those systems up and running as best as possible, wherever possible, but slowly that would become harder and harder as there would be fewer and fewer people who could actually do it, and fewer and fewer stable opportunities for those people to actually be able to come together to get it done. Consider electricity. Powering an entire country is actually a very complicated process. Not many people, unless they're specifically trained in it, actually understand how the whole process works at every point along the system, especially well enough to get it up and running from scratch. So if the Great Calamity were to lead to a massive loss of life, and or cause governments to collapse, and or deal a huge blow to social organization in general, it would lead to a situation where long-term power outages were the norm, and very quickly too. Many areas of the world today are already without electricity. It is quite sensitive to tumultuousness. It would be a struggle to maintain it, and as the decades pass, with fewer and fewer people actually being trained in those areas, most areas would lose power and never have it back. We probably wouldn't have a planet-wide blackout right away. There are ways of dealing with these issues in the event of a catastrophe, but electricity may very well become something reduced to select areas. These areas would probably mostly be the ones populated by higher classes, whatever that would entail. We'll call these areas villi, or villi lucis, Latin for places or towns of light, since they'll be more likely to have functioning electricity. The villi will form as the upper classes of the world realize what's going on. They will likely see it coming sooner than others. Using their political and social influence, wealth, position, abilities, or whatever the case may be, they will likely try to band together to escape the larger issues at hand. As things become harder throughout the world, protected communities would likely pop up wherein people, such as these, could go about living more stable lives, perhaps hanging on to a lot of the technologies that would become harder to manage throughout the rest of the world, such as electricity. They would likely be heavily guarded and not easy to be a part of. As order breaks down and armies disband, former police officers and soldiers would volunteer their services as mercenaries to guard these villi in exchange for a share for themselves and their families in the stability and higher standard of living offered in the villi. Doctors, firemen, engineers, and anyone who could perform a valuable practical service would have a better shot than most at getting in. Merely losing electricity would radically change our day-to-day -day lives, and that's just the beginning. Let's add on plumbing as well. When you look at how the whole system works, it's clear that plumbing is a complicated process and would be sensitive to a major catastrophe, just like electricity. So what happens when the sewers are blocked and you don't have functional water treatment facilities? Where would your water come from when it's shut off permanently? Where is your nearest source of clean fresh water? These are difficult questions and it does not help that many modern residences would not be built for this kind of situation. They are dependent upon modernity. How do you cool or heat your home? How do you cook your food, bathe, watch fire learning videos, or do anything on the internet? Electricity would be shut off. Batteries would be in short supply. All these things would suddenly disappear. 
The collapse of civilization might be a lot like camping in your house indefinitely, well past the point of fun. Some people have supplies to get them through a rough time, but how many people are really supplied for years? There are foods which can keep for a long time, pasta, canned goods, peanut butter, cereal. These can last for a year or more if stored properly and have preservatives. White rice, dry beans, honey, alcohol, these could last for decades in storage. But again, in this situation where things aren't going to get better anytime soon, hardly anyone will have enough. Even when the trouble starts, many people might not realize the severity of the situation. Perhaps a bit like the Romans, only when it is too late would the world realize that its prosperity and progress couldn't go on forever. The grocery stores will be picked apart at the first sign of danger, and will likely remain that way indefinitely. Most communities, at least in America, are not used to supplying their own food. Much of it is shipped across the country, creating dependence on a national and in fact international network. According to the FDA, 15% of food eaten in the US is imported from other countries, including about 30% of fresh vegetables and 55% of fresh fruits. A significant proportion of the rest of the food that we eat originates in another area of the country. This system will not be sustainable in the situation. Just as an example, on average, each American eats 13 pounds of oranges a year. You know what you don't find much of in a place like Minnesota, or Ohio, or Michigan? Orange tree plantations. Shipping large amounts of food and supplies across countries requires trucks, planes, ships, these kinds of things. If we can't maintain electricity, it will be very difficult, under the same circumstances, to mass produce fuel, continue to pump out cars and car parts to sustain repairs, organize expeditions, and all these sorts of things. Air travel, needless to say, would likely collapse very quickly. After an extended period of time, probably decades, cars might not totally disappear, but they could very easily become a luxury item like they used to be, reserved for those mostly in the villi. Now, you see where this is going. This means the average person would, very likely, decades down the road, have to go back to horses and whatnot. That's an issue. The population of horses in the US has more than halved in the past century, currently standing at about 9 million. Meanwhile, the human population has almost quadrupled. So, long distance transportation of food will gradually become less and less possible. When it gets bad enough, the shipments will stop. Eventually, it will be impossible to ship food and supplies across large distances. Even if an organization could do it, there would most certainly be the risk of being attacked by bandits, who could, for example, sit at uncomfortable areas of the highways, armed with guns, prepared to attack and raid semi-trucks. These bandits might not even be evil people, but simply people pushed to necessity. For this reason, moving any goods in general will be dangerous. Even when the food arrives, there would probably be things like hit and run raids on the grocery stores at some point. If the military could not come together, you could have rival gangs trying to control them. Eventually though, again, fairly quickly, the whole process would be unsustainable in the way that it currently is and collapse for good. This will mean increased pressure on communities to support themselves and their neighbors. A large portion of the population will then become gardeners and eventually farmers. It would not be that simple. The vast majority of people in countries like the US and Canada do not prepare their own food from start to finish. How many people in Western countries know how to grow corn or wheat, milk a cow, make cheese, prepare meat? It's not rocket science, but people would have to learn these things, which, despite being a part of everyday life, they are removed from in the middle of a disaster, and furthermore, get it right right away, or face starvation. Now, what could actually be seen slowly forming from the situation, again, over the course of decades, is an almost feudal type situation. The villi could be surrounded by these less well-off communities who are living in rough conditions and doing a lot of the farm work and menial labor, supplying food and supplies and things to the greater community, while being governed by the elites in the villi. This kind of organization is fairly simple and could very easily rise, but it would do so after a huge, huge, unrivaled disaster. If the Great Calamity can't be reversed, it will place a huge strain 
on the food supply, even when local communities start to grow their own food. Some communities would be able to handle the situation better than others, cough, Las Vegas, cough, but across the world, the situation would be very similar. Likely what would happen, at least in the beginning, is a mass starvation. The modern population is dependent on industrial farming, alongside other things of course which will also be difficult to produce like modern healthcare. It will be impossible to mass produce industrial farming equipment for a society which has a sudden mass need for it because industrial farming has collapsed. This will slowly, not right away necessarily, but gradually mean relying more and more on simpler forms of agriculture. This would lead us to a very sad reality. In fact, the most horrendous decline in population in history. The world population in about 1800, a little after the industrial and agricultural revolutions were getting going, was about 1 billion people. Maybe we could push it to 2 billion in this post-calamity situation, but it seems likely that there is a limit. A Malthusian limit, you could say. Thomas Malthus predicted that there are limitations to how far populations could go, which we would always be inevitably meeting as societies expand. We broke out of his predictions with the Industrial Revolution and found that societies tend to actually have a regression in birth rates when they become developed. But if our advances and knowledge were lost, his limits would be relevant again, and our population would be way too high above it. It would have to fall. Most likely, most people would die, and probably relatively quickly too. It could be 9 out of 10 people who don't make it. Billions of people. Far too many to bury. A sunny weekend in a middle class neighborhood. The sounds of children playing in the lawns. People walking their dogs and jogging on the sidewalks. The sounds of yard work. The smell of barbecues. These are all memories. These neighborhoods are now surrounded with fences, barbed wire, earthworks, and armed guards. Playgrounds where children used to spend their days are now turned into battlegrounds, dismantled and turned into farms. With the lack of food, medical supplies, and overall instability, the scene on the streets is too gruesome to describe. Scores of buildings, once happy homes, restaurants, bars and cafes, schools and libraries are left abandoned. Scavengers risk their lives to break into them. These villi will be the only ones left standing which can gain control of the surrounding area, maintain stability in this chaos, and promise people a chance at survival. It would be like going back to medieval times, but there wouldn't be much choice. Again, certain countries which are already rural will handle this better than others, but by this point it would be hard to imagine any of the modern countries of the world still existing like they do there would be huge, fast, fluctuating changes to the map. Not all countries would collapse in the exact same ways at the exact same times, but there is no country which would be spared from this disaster. In the past, collapses were reserved to certain areas of the planet, while other civilizations cut off from them carried on. Our global society, however, means a global collapse. The decline in medical technology and the availability of treatment and resources would add to the issue as well. Across all countries, people with disorders and diseases which were treatable in our modern age – asthma, diabetes, immunodeficiency, certain types of cancer, etc. – are now losing their lives. Infectious diseases, long controlled by antibiotics, vaccines, and medical technology, make a comeback and ravage populations. Meanwhile, dumpsters and junkyards are looted for resources like precious metals and plastics. Prisoners are either released or executed. Parking lots, golf courses, and sports fields are all turned into farms. There is a mass exodus from the cities as they now become too unstable. The highways, which span continents, are now empty and left to fall into disrepair. Hope for a return to past days becomes broken. Throughout most of the world, most people likely would not leave their immediate communities. This was the norm after all throughout most of the history of the planet, in fact. There wouldn't be a huge reason for the average person to anymore. Society would become isolated, strange, dark, dangerous. There would be no vacations. We would be so centered on our local communities that people we think of as our neighbors, just a half hour away today by car, would become almost foreigners. Now, would this attitude hold at the highest level? Probably not, and I imagine that the villi would cooperate through some means and become their own quasi-countries, either reforming old ones or creating new ones. 
but they might also compete. There could be a situation where other, slightly more distant communities become willing to go take the resources of another by force, leading to raids and warfare. How would these wars be waged? I would be reluctant to say that production of all modern weaponry would cease entirely. Tanks, stealth bombers, ICBMs, these would probably very quickly become things of the past, but firearms? Hard to say. They would offer such an advantage in a war that I could see the knowledge being preciously maintained and production being heavily emphasized at all costs. It would be the communities which held on to the knowledge and ability to construct firearms which would dominate. However, mass manufacturing of them, or of just anything in general, would be difficult, and battles could very well be a weird mashup of simpler weapons, swords, spears, bows and arrows, and modern weapons. To supply entire armies adequately, however, gun production might have to go back to simpler designs. Again, it's all hard to say. We could run through every single technology and aspect of our modern world and ask, would it survive a collapse, and if so, how well? But if you want to figure out whether or not X, Y, or Z will survive the collapse, or at least make an educated guess, a lot of it boils down to this. Will X, Y, and Z be able to survive a circumstance in which we lose, firstly, a huge amount of social organization to get things done cooperatively, and secondly, a lot of wisdom on how to actually construct those things? During and after the collapse, there could be people who are smart enough to get computers or a plumbing system or whatever running, but if there is a war going on, and all the factories have been destroyed, and the entire community has dropped in population, then there wouldn't be many opportunities for it. Inversely, there could be a situation later on where things might be kind of stable, but things could have regressed so much that the knowledge on how to construct a computer could be ancient lost technology that no one would really be able to figure out. Schools will stop when society collapses. What happens when class is dismissed for decades across most areas of the planet? Another thing worth its own attention though, as some people are curious about them, is nuclear power plants. Across the world there are, as of March 2020, over 400 with more on the way. 100 of them are in the USA, followed by France with 58 and China with 46. In our modern world, they are seen by some as a very promising source of energy. Could they, however, be ticking time bombs in this timeline? Well, thankfully, they are actually designed to shut down on their own, if left unattended. So you wouldn't have Chernobyls left and right across the planet. But you probably would not want to go right next to them or especially mess with them after they break down. That is, of course, very good news, especially for France here, which has half the number of reactors that the US does, but is only the size of Texas. You'd go to Paris and it would just be... the X-Men, I mean, it'd just be people with wings. <laughs> Likewise, there are a lot of preventative measures taken with nuclear weapons to prevent them from going off accidentally. It isn't actually that easy to get a nuclear weapon to explode. Of course, you don't want those things to have hair triggers after all. If history truly does repeat itself, then what would happen to the world's countries? Well, communities would be much more self-reliant and autonomous than they are today, but they would like to become part of larger countries when the dust settles and the strongest start to unite neighboring settlements. As we start to move into the long term, it could very easily be a situation similar to that of the early Dark Ages, where people don't have very strong loyalties to larger countries because it's simply a matter of to whom they send their taxes. You don't get strong nationalism from people who don't know much about what lies beyond their own villages and don't encounter more than a thousand people in their entire lives. That's how it was for many Europeans in 700 AD, and that is how it could very well be for people in 2200 AD. The modern nation-states of the world took a great deal of time to form. Some places still have difficulty becoming nation-states. The situation could mimic a medieval one. You could, for example, have a community which pledges its loyalty to a leader of a villa who pledges their loyalty to a governor or something, and a governor who pledges their loyalty to an even higher rank, like a king or a president. It's a very simple and almost obvious social organization, which is why it would very well be seen. Unfortunately, a lot of this would likely remain unrecorded, and people later on would have to guess about what happened during this time period, much like Western Europe from 500 to 800 AD. 
With this in mind, let's now look at how this may play out in the big picture and long term. 2260 AD. Cities across the world, once sprawling metropolises, are now ghost towns. A city like New York, once home to 8 million people, now contains fewer than 100,000. Similar situations are seen in Tokyo, Beijing, Paris, London, and Berlin. Other towns and cities have been left totally abandoned or are home to only a handful of people. The ruins of a past greatness now scatter the landscape, housing only a fraction of what they were designed to hold, much like the city of Rome in the centuries following the collapse of the empire. Giant skyscrapers cannot be maintained. They become home to things like birds and small animals, like cats and mice. The inhabitants of places like Chicago, London, and New York marvel at the structures, wondering how anyone could have ever built such things. It isn't clear how long they would stand. Some researchers boldly claim that they could last as long as the pyramids, but not all would be so lucky. Money, clothing, buildings, our diets, many things have greatly simplified. Memories of our old civilization have largely vanished as videotapes, CD-ROMs, and other ways of storing pictures and videos have corroded away. Countless texts, videos, social media accounts, and other aspects of the internet, which could have one day become historic records, have disappeared. Though more primitive and destructive forms of agriculture have returned, overall the environment is one thing which is thriving. Environmental restrictions are forgotten and certain areas have become more polluted, but again, overall, the oceans and skies are the cleanest they have been since the Industrial Revolution. Many plant and animal species are thriving again. However, without humans there to protect them, many others have gone extinct, losing the battle against invasive species for good. We now turn to the United States, or what it has become. Would the government in Washington, D.C. be able to hold on to the entire country? Would America survive from sea to shining sea? It would be exceedingly difficult. I imagine most people would still think of themselves as Americans, even if the country collapsed, but practical realities would overtake their older loyalties. Nations across the world may try to hold themselves together, even at just a formal level, but it would be difficult. Looking at North America over the course of decades and into centuries, you would very possibly have thousands of self-sufficient communities arise which pledge some kind of allegiance to a government in Washington DC or Ottawa or Mexico City. Again, they may think of themselves as Americans or Canadians or Mexicans or whatever, but in reality, there would be much, much less unity, especially as people become stressed, very stressed, tensions rise, resources become scarce, and wars break out between neighbors. In Europe, in the thousand or so years following the fall of Rome, countries were very scattered and disunited, only slowly coalescing. Many countries in Europe, and in fact most of the world, formed along geographic barriers, becoming England, France, Scotland, Denmark, Spain, and Portugal. This is not so much how all American states and Canadian provinces formed. Only some are, practically, positioned to be their own countries. Am I alluding to the fact that each state and province would become its own country? It would likely be much more complex than that. Places like Alaska and Hawaii would be the first to go, and probably, yes, quickly declare themselves their own countries, maybe even aligning themselves with other more well-off countries if those countries existed. Order in the lower 48 would break down later. As the centuries passed, these scattered quasi-countries could become real countries, like what happened in Europe. Appalachia, Ohio, Texas, Virginia, California, Florida, Cascadia, Dakota, Illinois, Colorado, Quebec, Manitoba, Yukon, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. How countries would form would largely be unpredictable, but the best guesses, like with most of the world, are along geographic barriers and with other factors. As the centuries passed, these differences would set in. People would forget that in the past, in more peaceful times, they were all a part of one country. It would be history. The Americas could effectively turn into the new post-Roman Europe. In the many countries that arise throughout the area, you would have a wide variety of new cultures and identities arise. 
As literacy drops and communities become isolated from each other, the English I'm speaking right now, which is being understood across the globe, would start to diverge in several different directions. The same would happen with Spanish and Portuguese in Latin America. Eventually, this standard English might be a classical language, the progenitor of a multitude of English-based languages which develop across North America and Oceania. In the future, someone from Pennsylvania could very easily have difficulty understanding someone from Oregon. Even though their ancestors spoke the exact same language, Appalachian and Cascadian could be as different from each other as Danish and German. With the advent of this, names would change. New York becomes Newark. New Orleans becomes Norland. Philadelphia becomes Philadelphia. Los Angeles becomes Los Angeles. San Francisco becomes San Francisco. Cincinnati becomes Cincinnati. And what about religion? How would religion fare? It's difficult to say exactly, and I'm only going to answer this objectively. I'm not going to share my personal religious views, but what seems to be objectively true is that religiosity tends to increase alongside stress. People seek out God or gods or greater meaning when life is genuinely hard. In Rome, religiousness was in decline ever since the beginning of the empire, but in late Rome, when things started to get bad again, people returned very heavily to religion. However, they did not embrace their pagan religion again. Some did, but many came to embrace the new religion of Christianity. What would happen to the world's religions in a new Dark Age scenario, I wonder? Would some grow stronger and others die out? Would the true religion, whichever one that may be, finally spread across the planet? Just as a side note, a group like the Amish, for example, could actually do very well. Mythology would likely arise across the world, partially about the people who lived in the past. People would be heavily uneducated and removed from the larger world. Americans would tell stories about their founding fathers. They wouldn't be sure if people like George Washington ever really existed, and fantastical stories about the founding fathers may very well arise. There would be a strong sense of fear of the outside world. Stories would be told about machine beings that were built by the old ones but never shut down who now wander the forest at night, preying on lost travelers. Stories about the moon landings would evolve into stories about how some of the old ones managed to migrate to the moon and remained there, escaping the dark times on the Earth. Every independence movement you could think of across the world would suddenly have much more potential as communities become much more self-sufficient and focused on themselves, and it becomes harder to manage large countries. The United Kingdom, for example, could, in the fray of things, fragment into its component nations. It would not be surprising, also, if the King or Queen of England suddenly regained real power in this situation, but how much power he or she would have over the whole of the country is, of course, unpredictable. A large amount of power could be lost, and there would likely be greater fragmentation in these nations themselves, with the island resembling a map much more like the one during the Dark Ages, with little kingdoms scattered all over the place. It would take centuries to put the pieces back together. 2456 AD, North America. Nations like the US and Canada are distant memories. The leaders of these new nations are often referred to as presidents, though the term is not what it used to be. Democracy has become much reduced or totally eradicated in many post-calamity nations, and the office of president is held for life, carries with it a religious duty, and oftentimes is passed to a family member. Some of the most powerful countries are those of Appalachia and Ohio. The president of Ohio, Willem I, has just spent the better part of his reign trying to bring his rebellious subordinates to heel, making Ohio a true nation. Appalachia, under Thomas III, however, has already done this, and is concerned by the growing might of their neighbor. In an effort to reduce Ohio's power, a war is waged between the two. Appalachia is clearly stronger. Major battles are fought in modern-day Pennsylvania. It is a long and strenuous war, but the army under Willem I is battle-hardened, and his support, owed to his efforts, is unquestioned. He is able to push back the Appalachians, and even expand his territory into Pennsylvania. Appalachia attempts to recruit their ally, the Kingdom of Ottawa, to distract Ohio on its other front, while the Ohioans respond by enlisting the help of Virginia, Appalachia's other rival. After years of fighting at the Battle of Philadelphia, Appalachia takes a serious blow. They are forced to surrender, and much of their territory is ceded to Ohio and Virginia. 
territory in a region called Michigan, and the city of Toronto is also annexed. It is after a life of further conquest and expansion that, while traveling to the old city of Washington, D.C., now simply called Washington, Willem I receives a bold title. President, not of Ohio, but President of the United States. His empire does not encompass the whole of the area, and in fact it breaks apart after his death, but title of President of the United States is sought after across the continent for centuries, even by leaders based in nations like Mexico and Canada. It is regarded as a title given to what is effectively the High King of the area. Whether or not a war like that would actually happen is, again, unpredictable. I'm sure that many people would disagree with how exactly this would play out, and that's fine. I'm not saying that everything in the scenario would definitely happen exactly as it is laid out here, but I do believe that some of these things would be quite likely. One of the issues with which many people might have disagreement is how long it would take to get civilization back and running again. Would we still be in a relative dark age in the late 2300s? Some people might think, oh well, you know, we'll have our collapse, but then we'll get right back into it in a couple decades and take off again. I am skeptical of that position, and I think history suggests that it takes a long time for civilizations to return to the same standards that they used to be at. Though our civilization is very different, you probably wouldn't be able to just reintroduce industrial society in a matter of a few years once it's disappeared for a long time. Civilization is not, not, not a simple thing. We have to keep in mind, how long did it take medieval Europe to have the things that Rome did at its height, like sewer systems and firefighting forces and a 10% literacy rate and things like this? You can view civilization as a bit like a marble statue. It takes a long time to carve it out and make it beautiful, but a collapse tends to happen very quickly. It will then take a very long time to put the statue back together from those pieces or to build a new one. The very intelligent man who first shared this analogy with me used a bomb as an example, but either way, I believe it works. A return to pre-industrial society would likely consist of a very violent crash, given that so much of our existence depends on the industrial and digital revolutions. Such a crash could cripple us for centuries. There's a fairly famous quote from the American novelist G. Michael Hopf. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Indeed, this could be said of Rome. As its golden age came to an end, weak men came to rule the empire and made numerous mistakes in its administration. Some historians and anthropologists subscribe to the social cycle theory, which holds that, indeed, civilization and history do not merely progress forever in a linear fashion, but run in cycles. If true, at some point, we could come to a scenario like this. It's hard to say though. We may have already reached a point where we break out of the cycle. However, if our civilization does one day collapse, with this knowledge in mind, then somewhere, somehow, civilization would rise again. A renaissance would occur as people rediscovered and, where necessary, reinvented the technology of the 19th through 21st centuries, and then went even further. Perhaps they would go into space, going so far as to terraform planets like Mars and Venus, or even venture off into interstellar space to colonize planets around other stars. Many people are curious about whether or not the nations of the modern world will share the same fate as Rome. It's a popular topic. Given that you have watched this whole video, you are likely one of those people. It is impossible to say what the future holds, but I will say two things to this question. Firstly, a knowledge of history will allow us to prevent many of the mistakes made by failed civilizations. So go watch all my history videos. Secondly, maybe, maybe not. Maybe some things are out of our control and inevitable. Who can be sure of everything? But like every other generation in human history, all we can possibly do in the face of these dark possibilities is to wake up in the morning and do our best. On that note, I hope 
you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. To support the channel, a donation on Patreon would be a big help. A special thanks to our current Patreon supporters, once again listed here. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and there will be a link to come join our Discord server in the pinned comment, so come check us out there too. Thank you for watching.